I have to say, it's wonderful to see so many people supporting what I've been doing for the last 25 years. And for a lot of people, they believe, just briefly before I get to talk to the guys here, that in media, that there's some, re some reason as to why many of the mainstream broadcasters won't talk about certain things. There is no reason why they won't mm -hmm. talk about it. Because I can tell you now, the BAI or the Broadcast Authority, which they were, they've now been renamed as another organization, are extremely fair. I'll give you one example. On one occasion, I got 117 complaints from the same person in the same week, <laughs> which meant we had to reply to each individual complaint. Um, all the complaints were rejected. <clears throat> and the reason they got rejected was because the Broadcast Authority said there was an audience expectation. In other words, my audience know that I'll challenge people and challenge their views. And if all broadcasters did the same thing, we wouldn't be in the position we're in today where we have so many people in the room. Well, I suppose I met Michael some time ago, um, actually my contact director, who is also my wife, uh, met Michael when we decided to do our podcast, and she was intrigued by Michael. And the reason she was intrigued was because of the Twitter files. And if you're not familiar with the Twitter files, the Twitter files were basically an expose on censorship in America. And America, I suppose, Michael, let's go to you first. You wouldn't imagine you would have censorship in America when you have the First Amendment, which is exactly what we would love to have, which protects our freedom to speak. So how did the Americans, or how did America, end up in that situation? Well, sure. I mean, I, it starts with me in 2020. My book, Apocalypse, never came out, and I wrote a sort of summary of the findings. And one of them was that natural disasters aren't getting worse. They're actually getting better, meaning the number of people who die in natural disasters globally has declined by over 90%, even as the population quadrupled, and the cost of natural disasters over the last 30 years has gone down. This is all widely accepted data, and yet Facebook censored my article about this, and they put a warning on it, and the warning said misleading information. So it wasn't even that I was censored. They, they didn't even say that it was inaccurate. They were just saying that the information that was true might lead you to the wrong conclusions. And that was my first sense that there might be something very wrong with how we've arranged our social media. And then in 20, uh, December last year, Elon Musk uh, bought Twitter and he took it over. And a friend of mine who's a, a well-known journalist in the United States named Barry Weiss, along with Matt Taibbi, were invited in uh, by Elon Musk to uh, basically make requests of the staff there to look at what had been going on beforehand. And that initially started with us looking at some big events, particularly Twitter's censorship of Hunter Biden, laptop uh, censorship or deplatforming of President Trump on January 8th, two days after the January 6th riots. And at first it looked like just a sort of political correctness of Twitter staff. 99% uh, of all political donations from Twitter staff went to Democrats. It's very progressive. It's a company located in San Francisco. But then we started to discover all of these requests for censorship by U.S. government agencies, including the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, uh, something they called um, OGA for other government agencies, which we, real which we soon learned was a secret code for the CIA. And we realized that there was a whole effort by U.S. government agencies working with NGOs. And NGOs, the CIA is famous for working both, both putting their people as journalists at mainstream news organizations and also working through NGOs. And we realized that what we were looking at was multiple organizations, literally hundreds of NGOs, working to do the censorship pressure on the social media platforms um, on the behest of governments. And so we, we, realized, we realized what this was, was the censorship industrial complex. And that work has helped to now lead to a major lawsuit between the state attorneys general of Missouri and Louisiana this is called Missouri versus Biden, and just last week uh, we learned that it looks like the U.S. Supreme Court will finally hear this case. So it is, uh, we hope to have a victory uh, because it is a clear uh, violation of the First Amendment. At the same time, we still think these private NGOs are continuing to do similar to what they're doing in Ireland, which is putting pressure on the social media companies, and that may still be constitutional. So we're at risk of seeing the continuation of the censorship industrial complex even if, even with a win in front of the Supreme Court. 
I have to say, Ben, listening to what Michael has to say, we have seen stories suppressed here in Ireland on a regular basis. Only recently, of course, the Irish Mirror ran a story regarding a child, or should I say a school teacher, who asked the children in the class to refer to her as a they, them. The Irish Mirror were the only newspaper, with the exception of Crip, that ran the story. Um, why do you think this is happening in Irish media? Is it because journalists are afraid to such stories? Are they afraid this is just too much trouble? If I want to talk about immigration, if I want to talk about gender identity, transgenders, are they afraid that they lose their jobs? Are they afraid that they'll get some sort of public backlash? Why do you think media are censoring themselves? Yeah, it's a great question, because I feel like, in my experience, having interacted with many of these journalists on a person-to-person -person basis when I go to government press events and I speak to these people, you'd be surprised how reasonable they are uh, in contrast to what we see from the actual output that they, they put out online, that you would assume these are people who are totally ideologically possessed and very one-sided, and uh, that, that's sort of the impression they give off. But then when I talk to them in person, they're perfectly reasonable. A lot of them have kind of uh, implied to me that they sympathize with the, the views of more, I don't know what you want to say, conservative people or people who have a different opinion to the mainstream. And so the impression I get from having talked to them is that this is something that's being uh, imposed upon them for, in a top-down way by their editors or by their corporate masters in, within the news company they work for, that somebody up the chain of command is telling them, don't ask about this, don't ask about that. That's we, how we've seen things. you go to press conferences and terrorize ministers. <laughs> <laughs> we always know. Uh, we always know as soon as Ben is going to ask a question because usually one minister will roll their eyes. <laughs> yeah. so, there's, there's at least 20 journalists in that room, or at least 10 or 20 journalists, and if we're to assume that half the population is reasonably conservative in their views, why are more of those journalists not asking those ministers exactly the same questions that you are? I, I wonder that all the time, because to your point that you made at the start about how there is no reason why journalists shouldn't ask about these questions, before I got into media, I used to naively think, you know, I wish such and such a journalist had asked the minister this question, but maybe there's a good reason for it. Maybe I'm just ignorant and they know something I don't about why that wouldn't be an appropriate question or wouldn't be acceptable. And then I actually became a journalist and I realized, no, I think you guys are just kind of bad at your job, to be honest. <laughs> there's not really any... Because if I, if I worked for one of these time-tested publications, some of them have been around for 100 years or more, and they're, you know, staples of Irish society, and I saw this little upstart organization with a skeleton crew and comparatively almost no resources. We're going up against behemoths like RTE that have hundreds of millions of euros guaranteed every single year in taxpayer funding. And this little organization that could is consistently blowing them out of the water in terms of, you know, million views here, two million views there. Uh, I, I would be embarrassed, frankly, and I'd start scratching my head and thinking, what are they doing that we could learn from? But it seems like that, if that conversation is happening in newsrooms, they haven't applied it because it's just the same drudgery, the same boring lines of questioning. You know what it is, is it's all logistical questions. So. I'll just make up an example. Let's say the government is talking about bringing in a new tax on cars, let's say. The journalist will ask, so will this apply to tractors as well? And, you know, when, when you, how is it going to be collected? Is it going to be collected from this government agency or that government agency? And nobody asks the question, is this a good idea? Should you be doing this at all? And so, yeah, I find it just incomprehensible, the, the level of, the lack of curiosity that we see from the press as a, as a sector at this point. I mean, in relation to Ireland's hate speech laws, you basically had said to me in an interview recently that you believed that anybody that agreed with these laws was pathological. Do you still stand by that? And also in relation to that as well, we have seen studies, according to the Institute of Strategic Dialogue, that hate has <laughs> increased, but you believe it actually hasn't. No, of course it hasn't. I mean, 
And it's the, you know, I mean, Ireland's not that different from the rest of the Western world in the sense, I mean, in the 1950s, only 7% of Americans uh, believe that black people and white people should be allowed to be married. Today, it's over 95%. Um, levels of tolerance have increased everywhere in the Western world. So you have to ask what's going on with this new demand for censorship, which we're seeing in multiple countries at the same time. We're, uh, after this, we hopefully will be in Brazil to help to fight back there. But I, so I think there's one part of it, you go look, it's just a political strategy. These politicians, Helen McEntee, she just wants to censor her political opponents, and that's just a political move. But I also think there's some deep intolerance. So, I mean, the irony, as you can detect, right, is that the people saying that they want to promote tolerance and stand about hate speech are full of hatred of people they disagree with, are completely intolerant of people they disagree with. What is that about? I think on the one hand, it's an expression of privilege. Another thing you often hear them accusing others of, they, they, they don't, people that are very privileged, have been coddled, um, have been in a bubble, they don't like to have to hear differences of opinion. It's literally disconfirmatory information is serotonin depleting, it's dopamine depleting, we know that. So it makes them, they don't like how that makes them feel having to deal with that uncomfortable information, so they want to stamp it out. That's a, that's, an, that's a sign of privilege. That's the king who doesn't want to have to hear from anybody that disagrees with him in the kingdom. And so when I say it's pathological, I actually think that's true. I mean, we've seen, it's been well documented from psychologists over decades. There's something called concept creep, which is that our definition of what's harmful has radically increased. So that people now think that words themselves can cause physical harm in the world. They get, that's why I was just on the streets of Dublin this morning for two hours with a film crew just interviewing people about this law. And it would, I, you know, people kept trying, people would kind of go back and forth on it. And I would sort of say, well, it seems like what you're against is incitement to violence, which is already illegal. And they would sort of say, well, yeah, but also speech that's harmful. So you see that concept creep everywhere, but we also see a uh, rise of what psychologists call cluster B personality disorders, which is the two most famous are narcissism and antisocial personality disorders. Uh, without diagnosing any individual, <laughs> um, there is something about this. There's uh, something called the third party effect, which is when you talk to people that want to go and censor misinformation and you say to them, well, what about yourself? Like, what have you said that you think the government should have censored? They're just, like, confused. <laughs> like, what do you mean? I haven't said anything wrong ever in my entire life. That's a form of narcissism. I mean, we just have to call it what it is. It's a sense of grandiosity and a sense of entitlement. And so I do think that ultimately you have to describe this. There's a beautiful book. Uh, it's a little academic, but it's called Political Ponerology. And it was written by a Polish psychologist who lived through Nazism and also lived under communism in Poland. And he said, he said, totalitarianism is psychopathology in government. It's when the most psychotic and or, uh, psycho, uh, psychopathic and narcissistic people take control of the society. They control the institutions. These are often mediocre thinkers. He describes the head of the university he worked at as being just a terrible historian, I believe, and just a bad thinker, but he was a thug, and he was willing to just crush anybody that was in his way. And I think that's what we're starting to see across the Western world. We see different institutions taken over by ideologues who absolutely don't care about what they do to other people. And that's why I think it's so important for us to unite, I mean as liberals, as conservatives, left, right, whatever, to demand free speech, because we're up against a very serious totalitarian threat. I I, I suppose, Ben, there is an argument that we're fighting a pointless battle because if we go back, say, 50 years ago, the Catholic Church ruled Ireland with, a, with an iron fist. Uh, bishops would run down to the head office of the Irish Independent to stop them running a story. They'd run out to RTE, the Religious Affairs Department, to stop them running a show that might criticize God or criticize the Catholic Church. Eventually, even after Dermot O'Hearn increased the legislation to put us in jail and charge us 25,000 euro for denying the existence of God, we eventually had a referendum that got rid of blasphemy laws. And the left will argue, well, look, we're only getting our own back on you. So the pendulum has just swung the other way. And essentially what's happened now is 
we have introduced new blasphemy laws which are protecting another minority. So we've basically gone back to where we were before, but just on the other side. So is the pendulum eventually going to swing back anyway? Uh, that's a good question. I think that it's certainly the case that, the, of course, as you say, old Ireland was very uh, restrictive in a lot of ways. There's no denying that under any circumstances. But uh, the solution to that is not to adopt another kind of theocracy, effectively, which is, as, as you, you alluded to, that's eff effectively what we're facing. And I think that when you're looking at these people, they, they view themselves as such kind of pure, you know, we, we've given up the superstitious dogma of the past, and we're the enlightened thinkers. They got it wrong, you know, 20, 30, 50 years ago, but we're the ones who are going to set everything right. And then you look at the ideologies they're promoting, and they can't tell me if Arnold Schwarzenegger is a man or a woman. They can't tell me basic facts about reality that a child could tell you. And you go, yeah, you don't look so enlightened to me, frankly. Uh, not, you know, I, I'm opposed to the, the legislation on principle, but I think one really strong argument against it is to say, even if I agreed with the idea that there should be hate speech laws, I don't trust you with them. You know, the, the kinds of people who we're dealing with. Because we're talking about hate speech here, but there's, there's other elements to this as well, like, for example, uh, the so-called misinformation strategy. And, and Michael was discussing this, how obviously this is a big problem in America and across the Western world as well. And I don't know how many people will have seen an interaction I had with Ireland's new electoral commission, which is this body that the government set up uh, to regulate misinformation and disinformation, so-called, around election times and referenda and things of that nature. And... You know, you, you think about the kinds of power that these organizations have where they can literally get a high court order and force you to remove any piece of content you post. Uh, they can order you to have to correct, you know, missteps or misinformation that you publish in a political ad, let's say, if you're running a campaign. And I, I don't know that anybody should have that kind of power. I don't think I trust any human being, because we all have our biases. We're all of a certain view. You know, I'm a conservative person. I'm a religious person. I know that influences my picture of the world. And so I wouldn't be, have so much hubris that I would think, oh, no, I'm the one who should be able to control what anybody here was allowed to say and think. And so the fact that there are people in society who are clawing at that power and who desperately want to wield it and think that they're going to do it responsibly, I think that's incredibly dangerous. I mean... <clears throat> it is fair to say, you know, that we've had censorship. Do you, do you actually think that censorship is ever necessary? Is there anything that should be censored at all, in your view? I mean, we, we already, of course, like, I think we should take calls to violence out of the censorship conversation, because what we're really talking about when we talk, you know, we talk about free speech, and of course we believe in free speech, but I think what that means is freedom of opinion. You should be allowed to have any opinion you want, you, even if it's a horrible opinion, even if I find it totally repugnant, that's not my business, because opinions are just that, they're just ideas. Uh, of course, calls to violence saying that we should go attack this person, we should attack this group of people, that's not an opinion, that's a call to action. And so that's already well and truly dealt with under law in Ireland and in most of these countries. It doesn't need to be relitigated. We don't need to keep going back to that. That's a kind of a sleight of hand you'll see uh, when I interact with ministers and this topic comes up and I'll ask them about the hate speech legislation. They always jump right to the violence one because that's the easiest one to defend. You know, it's, it's very easy to say, oh, well, uh, this guy is running around saying that we should murder entire races of people. You don't agree with that, do you? And you go, yeah, that's already a crime. He'd be arrested for that today, with or without the legislation. What you're talking about is somebody hurting another person's feelings or be, being hateful. You want to legislate human emotion, and that's an entirely different thing. And that's where it gets incredibly dangerous. So to yeah. answer your question, no, I don't think any ideas I, I, should be And here's the problem. When we talk about censorship and we talk about hate speech, there's a confusion around what's hate speech and what's misinformation. And somebody mentioned earlier on an organization in Ireland, or should I say a media organization in Ireland, who I will not name because they don't deserve the credit. But they fact-checked me three times. And each time they fact-checked me, they found out that I was right, but they just didn't like me anyway. So right. they're going to take around <laughs> things about me. Yeah. So in other words... In relation to misinformation, 
The classic example you've talked about all the time was during COVID, where people who had suggested that COVID may have leaked from a lab in Wuhan were immediately banned from Facebook, Twitter, or anywhere else at the time before Elon owned it, obviously. Uh, they were banned and had their accounts suspended. We now know, of course, and you've talked about this before, of course, that, you know, most likely it did leak from a lab in Wuhan, but yet they're still banning people for saying that. So where's the fine line between misinformation and hate speech or, or, the, or the wrong speech? Well, this is an incredibly important thing to understand, which is the people demanding the censorship are the same people spreading the disinformation. Mm -hmm. They're not two separate groups. So the people that said it was a discredited, a debunked conspiracy theory that the virus leaked from the lab were the same people who demanded censorship. Mm -hmm. So the people who spread the disinformation demanded the censorship. The people who said the vaccine would, pre would prevent infection and transmission, which was missing disinformation, demanded censorship of people who questioned that. We saw, in terms of Black Lives Matter, we saw uh, the spread of misinformation and disinformation that there was an increase, a significant increase in police violence against African Americans, which was false. It has, uh, statistically, the data is very clear from the FBI that it has declined precipitously from the 1970s. They spread the disinformation and then they demand censorship of people who disagree with them. So anybody who's spreading, who's demanding censorship, that's your first clue that they're spreading disinformation and need to be debunked. Now, there's some debate in our free speech movement around whether we should even use these words, mis- and disinformation. I actually think you do need to use these words because it perfectly describes, for example, what Anthony Fauci did. When they went out to supposedly debunk the lab leak theory, they were spreading disinformation. It's the best word to describe it. And I think there's another question of whether or not we should be involved in fact-checking. I'm a journalist, so I f we fact-check every article. We publish every day. Every day we're fact-checking. So then the question is, who fact-checks the fact-checkers? Um, that's a really big problem, and I think the right answer is, we should. And so we're building a fact-check alliance with, with our organization, with GRIPT, with newspapers and other, uh, other newspapers around the world, so we can fact-check the fact-checkers and stand up against the censors. That's what we're going to do. We, we, uh, we had a classic example of that recently. I think John McGurk will attain to that. We had a classic example where the fact checkers tried to tell us that a race wasn't actually a race. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, in relation to censorship and going forward, I suppose, Ben, you know, the idea that, you know, you look to and you talked earlier on um, in this piece of legislation, in particular the hate speech legislation, they asked for public submissions. They got the public submissions. You trawled through them. I mean, there's no other journalist in the country that actually went to that trouble of going through the submissions on 3,200 of them, or whatever it was. Um, they clearly stated that we don't need this piece of legislation, that we all understand that it's wrong to be violent towards another person. Uh, we all understand that, of course, hatred and violence together is a bad thing and you should go to jail, although there is a debate around whether people should be treated equally, no matter why they commit an assault. But in relation to those, those submissions, you then presented this to the government at a press conference, sent it to Leo Varadkar, and he completely dismissed you. So are the government listening to these people at all, the people who voted for them? Well, I'll tell you what, what's fascinating about that exchange in particular is, as you say, I presented this to the Taunas, or I think he was the Taoiseach at the time, Leo Varadkar, and I said, so you have received this overwhelmingly negative response to your own consultation. As I said in the speech, the key part of the word consultation is to consult. I'm asking you, hey, what do you think, Joe Bloggs? Let's see what the public's opinion is of this issue before we do anything. They received people telling them we don't want it, you know, shovel where the sun don't shine. And so I asked him, why did he bother doing the consultation if you're just going to ignore the results? And what he said was, you know, I think these consultations are important, but they're not really representative of public opinion <laughs> because most people didn't weigh in on it. You know, it was only a couple of thousand people, and so it's not really reflective of Ireland as a whole. So at that point, I asked him the natural question, which is, if that's the case, why did you bother doing it? You know, why would you hold a consultation that you know from the start is going to be totally unrepresentative, because actually thousands of responses from one of these consultations is a lot more than most of them get. Usually they get like 100 or less, uh, because, you know, I'd say there's about five consultations going on right now that none of us in this room even know about, about various miscellaneous crap, because that's the way government bureaucracy works. Long story short, 
as I say, he said, I asked him, why did you bother doing it if it's not going to be representative of public opinion? And his response was that, you know, the government runs the society. We, we have a de democratic system, and so consultations, uh, we, don't, we don't make decisions based on consultations or on opinion polls. Like, we, we hold the power, basically, as elected representatives. And what's, uh, oh, and uh, this is the kicker, this is the best part of all. He said that often these things are just hijacked by campaigning groups with an agenda, that some, <laughs> some activist group will say, hey, everybody, go in and flood it. And what's so amazing about that is, when the consultation was going on, the, go the Department of Justice was tweeting out, tagging NGOs that were known to support hate speech laws, the NGOs like INR and so on, that had been campaigning for hate speech laws for years prior, and they were tagging them, effectively saying, hey guys, get in there and flood it. So he would know that there were activists trying to influence the consultation, because it was his activist. He's the one who did it. <laughs> and 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 you can be sure if you can be sure if 76% of those submissions had said it was a great law, they would have used it, it in every single newspaper. It would have been ironclad, and anybody right. who questioned it would be an anti-democratic scumbag. Yes. Pretty I, I disinformation. To, well, exactly. Absolutely. I want to talk about this, you know, as being a bigger thing because everybody talks about they, and we always think about they as people in a room or conspiring, conspiring somewhere in the world against us. And I just want to quote you because you said yourself, the war on free speech is hardly a novel phenomenon, instead mutating over centuries, which is new. However, it is global aspirations today. The conflict takes the form of world war. So you kind of declare free speech as a war, I suppose a war of the people, to actually stand up for themselves. Is, is that what you're trying to say? Well, yeah, I mean, also I was trying to say, to, I mean, I, I, I've been educated about this issue. I didn't really know much about free speech because I never thought it was at risk uh, for all of, my, all of my life. And it was only recently that I became so afraid of what had happened. And, you know, there was two things that I realized. The first was that there had been a debate about whether free speech is just sort of a good thing to have so that you can have a democracy and free markets or is it a fundamental human right? Is it something that you'd need in order to be fully human? And you can probably guess where I come down on that issue. The other is that the United States is very different in that we were created by putting in place the First Amendment is a protection of free speech. We have similar limits just as you do on fraud, on incite immediate incitement to violence, child exploitation, those are things that we don't allow, but otherwise we're very free. In Europe, you all had to fight for more free speech more gradually over time. You had to win that right more gradually. Well, here we are in a situation where free speech only matters on the internet. If you, you can go to the town square, but there's nobody at the town square. There's nobody listening there. Uh, print newspapers are basically dead. And so if you can control the social media platforms upon and the search platforms, Google, we don't talk enough about, Facebook, Twitter, if you control those, you control the information environment of the entire planet. I mean, the reason, one of the reasons I'm so worried about what's going on in the European Union is if they establish a censorship regime in Europe, it will censor us in America and censor people in Brazil and around the world. So that's why having an international bottoms up, not top down, top down but bottom up free speech movement is the only way we're going to protect this right Just in our own Just on that countries. note, I know I interrupted you, but do you think Elon Musk is going to fight Europe on this uh, digital treaty? Uh, at the moment, he says he's not going to comply with it, but does that mean essentially what could happen, and we've seen that in places like China and what have you, where Twitter will essentially be banned from Europe? Do you ever see that happening? I mean, the first thing we have to understand is that we wouldn't have known about any of this if, if Elon Musk hadn't bought Twitter, and so we really do owe him a debt of gratitude <laughs> for that reason. I mean, truly. And, and by the way, I, just so less people question my, my integrity on this issue, I'm, I'm probably one of the most prominent critics of Elon Musk in the United States before I met him, because if you read Apocalypse Never, my book on the environment, I criticize his views of renewables. Um, but we really owe him a debt of gratitude. At the same time, there is an absolute war on Elon Musk and Twitter right now that you have to fully appreciate. How I mean, the Biden administration has weaponized the entire federal government. The FTC is cracking down on Twitter. The Department of Justice is cracking down on SpaceX 
for not hiring enough non-Americans, even though they told them that they couldn't hire any Americans, uh, any non-Americans for national security reasons. And there's a major advertiser boycott going on by three organizations, Institute for Strategic Dialogue, this, uh, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, and the Anti-Defamation League. And they have succeeded in reducing advertising revenue to Twitter by 70%. So I sent him a message and I was like, Thank you know. Thank you for buying Twitter. It was a really important philanthropic investment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he said thank you, but I still it needs to be a functioning business. So he's under enormous pressure. For me, the bottom line is we can't sit around and just pray to the to Elon Musk to do the right thing. We, he needs a strong movement to to pressure him to provide him the support he needs. He hired a CEO that made all of us very nervous because she said you have a right to freedom of speech, but not freedom of reach. In fact, freedom of reach is part of your freedom to speech. If you go and shadow ban us or censor us by, you let, it, let the tweet be up there, but then you don't let it go viral, that's censorship. It's like saying you're, you're free to go anywhere you want within this basement. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's right. So, so we have to, that's why I think it's important. Yeah. People ask about Elon. Don't pray to Elon Musk. Let's build a movement instead. That's what we need to do. And I I also believe here in Ireland, I know you were responsible for the Twitter files um, in America, and um, I believe in Ireland that we also need a Twitter files here too, because of course Twitter is the European headquarters here in Ireland, and I certainly believe that during COVID, many people who stood up against the lockdowns, and I'm proud to say I was one of the only broadcasters on air that I didn't agree with them. I got into... <laughs> I thought, it was a, there was a few times that the job nearly went, but they stood by, <laughs> they stood by me. But I think Twitter at that time were censoring people. Uh, and particularly, I was named in a couple of reports that were paid for by the state. Stephen Donnelly, of course, were pay, was paying for a report every month. I, I've actually felt quite proud of the fact they named me individually out of all the people in media because I was considered to be anti-government. Do you think going forward, these reports are going to be continued? Because that's really a form of censorship because you're embarrassing people or trying to get people cancelled. And is cancel culture going to get worse, Ben? Well, yeah, I mean, I'd love to see the correspondence between the social media companies and the government during that time, because the things the government officials were saying publicly were so heinous that I can only imagine what kinds of conversations were happening behind closed doors. And I think the, I believe it was the Telegraph in the UK did a story about Matt Hancock and the way their officials were talking about COVID. And so you'd love to be a fly on the wall or get access to, to some of these uh, exchanges just to see the extent to which this kind of censorship was happening. Because I thought the, the, the thing you're talking about as far as the government outsourcing the censorship to private firms or NGOs or companies, the, what's so particularly insidious about that is if a government department does something, they're subject to freedom of information requests. So you can find out, oh, the Department of Health was doing this, the HSE was doing that, and it can all come out in the, you know, in, in the fullness of time. Whereas if you're censored by a private company that's been hired by the government, they're not subject to the same laws. So you have no idea what they were up to, why they banned this person or that person, and so it's infinitely more opaque. So it's like the government hires these groups to do their dirty work in order to, it's, it's a way to be less accountable to the people so far as I'm yes. concerned. And, uh, and, and the other thing is well, Michael was talking about the fact that nowadays people, when they, they have a problem, they go to social media. So if they get upset, they go to social media. If they want to group together, they go to social media hoping they get a viral tweet. And I think it's done more damage to society in some ways. We think it's good. We think, oh, you know, John doesn't like such a law, so he's not to get 10,000 viral tweets. Isn't that great? But it doesn't bother the government. What used to bother the government was when people walked out onto the streets and blocked up the O'Connell Street. The last classic example of that would have been the water charges here in Ireland. But people seem to have lost the ability, or maybe social media has taken away that ability because they feel they've done their bit by saying something on social media. Do you think people have lost the ability to actually get out there and stand up to something? In, in a way, and you know, this is something that I've been thinking about recently, because a lot of people when this issue comes up like to ask, what can, what can we do? What can an ordinary person do uh, who doesn't have a big following and who isn't you know, fabulously wealthy and I just want to make a difference in the area of free speech and, and like, what's my contribution? And I've been thinking about that question and something that occurred to me was, uh, something you could do is when a politician knocks on your door 
for the local elections, for the parliamentary elections, whatever kind of uh, electoral process is going on, make it known to them that censorship is something that you're worried about. Tell them, I will not be voting for any politician that is trying to censor me and take away my rights. And just let them know that point blank. Because if they hear that enough times, one person they can ignore. Two people, they go, oh yeah, they're just a couple of you know, far right, quote unquote, fr cranks, and we can ignore them safely. But if every single door they're knocking on, they're getting people saying, I'm really worried about this, and I will not be voting for you if you support it. That will actually give them pause for, for thought for a minute. Because uh, you know, I think a lot of people are of the opinion that, ah, sure, look, they, they don't care about us, and they don't care what I think. And that's absolutely true, as we've seen with the consultations. But they care about their careers. They care about their own seats. And so if you can show that this is a red line issue for you, I think that that will actually impact them in a profound way. Because I think we're getting a lot of public attention internationally. Well, we got it from you, Michael, and you've got quite a following on Twitter. We've also had Elon Musk talk about the Irish laws. Yes. The richest man in the world with 450 million followers or whatever. But is that actually going to make a difference? Because we still see a minister who completely ignores it and ignores us, ignores the submissions. Uh, she's been asked by Ben on numerous occasions to show some sort of proof that it has support. And she insists it has support, but yet has to show that proof. But is it going to make any difference when we have international, large international people who have a lot of following? who are saying this is not a good thing. Well, I don't think that, I don't know that we're making a difference. I mean, the reason I'm here is because I was so inspired by Ben and Alex and Senator Keegan. I mean, these guys, you guys are real, it's genuinely, you guys are real heroes, so seriously. It's amazing. I, I will say, we, we hosted a meeting in June, and I, that's where I met Ben for the first time, and everybody was absolutely blown away by the Irish contingent. The Irish are very passionate, as we can see, and so it's infectious. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we saw this all happening on Twitter. We saw Ben grilling the prime minister, and we were like, wow, you can do that? That's amazing. <laughs> um, and then we couldn't really believe that the law was as, drac was as draconian as it appeared. And then Senator Keegan, we saw her just kind of speak into the, just from her heart, speak right into her phone. And that tweet went viral. And so we were like, we just got to be a part of putting that thing down. I mean, this is the worst law I've seen in my entire career of working on political issues. I mean, it is heinous law. I think we all need to understand, I mean, it's really, for me, it's, I'm an old-fashioned lefty in this way, which is that an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. And, and if we can't stop this terrible law in Ireland, then I fear for Western civilization, I genuinely do. So that's why I'm here. That's why I'm so... Uh, just captivated and inspired by, by what you guys are doing and being able to interact with you. So a lot of, if we get a big victory in Ireland, then it's going to be on to Brazil, back to the EU, back to the UK, and we'll make a run on the whole West. That's what we should do. I mean, Michael mentioned the word lefty. Of course, uh, nowadays, if you try and speak out better, if I say something on the radio, I'm known as a, a right-wing extremist, which I'm certainly not by any stretch of the imagination. You're a complete nutcase. case. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think these words and these labels, is it being purposely used to silence people? Because it is a form of censorship. By turning around to Ben Scallon or Niall Boylan and saying you're right-wing or you're right-wing extremist, do you think that's a form of censorship? In other words, it's telling everybody else to ignore you. Yeah, it's, it's telling people to disengage their brain because, uh, you know, when you tire somebody with a horrible brush of labeling them as an ist or a phobe of this variety or that variety, you know, most people, in a contradictory way, most of us are so decent and reasonable that the people doing this know that and they know that the easiest way to discredit somebody is to say that this is a hateful, horrible person. But ironically, that wouldn't work if we didn't live in a highly tolerant society. Do you know what I mean? You know, the fact that we are all so decent is why being called a, a right-wing, a far-right person, or an extremist, or a racist, that is the worst thing you can be in society, and we all agree with that. It's a horrible, horrible thing to be smeared with falsely. So, yeah, I think it is a kind of a weaponized a slur word that's used to shut people up because they just know that we're all 
you know, our better nature is to shy away from people who are hateful and so on. And that's a great thing, but it's easily exploited, unfortunately, to the benefit of uh, malicious people. Yeah. yeah. People who want to send the police into your homes yes. and search your phones and computers. I mean, yeah. I it mean, speaks the, the for itself. The minister spoke herself there recently on primetime, and she was asked again to define the word hate, which she won't do. She said she's been advised by the judge. Well, well, actually, general. it does. It's, yeah, hatred means hatred. That's what the bill actually says. <laughs> so I'm glad they cleared that up. So she was also asked as well. She was given a few examples, which I thought was hilarious. It was almost like a pantomime at Christmas. She was given examples. So if this person did this and said that, would that be hated? Um, no, that would be OK. And, then, <laughs> uh, and what about J.K. Rowling? Uh, yeah, no, that wouldn't be covered. That would be OK. We're, we're clear about that would be OK. So what I'm saying is a woman, essentially, and I'm just going to say a woman, forget the fact that she's the Minister for Justice, deciding what people can and can say. Is that what the take you've got yeah. from that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I recently, I think just last week, asked Minister for Justice Helen McEntee, uh, w is it conceivable, could she guarantee that nobody in Ireland will ever go to court for misgendering another person uh, or something of that nature. And I specifically phrased it that way because I think whether they're convicted or not is kind of irrelevant. If you even make it to court, if you're even having to justify yourself for saying that a man is a man or a woman is a woman, that already we've crossed a terrible line in society. So I asked her, could she guarantee that that's never going to happen here? And she said that she doesn't believe that that would categor be categorized as hatred. And so she was pretty confident that that's never going to happen. I think those words will come back to haunt her probably. Anyway. Well, well, I hope she's right. And frankly, uh, this is my personal opinion. I think that if that ever does happen, and you know, we see something like that in this country, as we've seen in other jurisdictions, I think the minister has some serious questions to answer. Because if you've drafted the legislation in a way that even things that were unforeseeable to you as the minister are now taking place, terrible things that you're telling us you never intended, that's uh, a serious dereliction of duty, so far as I'm concerned. So I hope, I hope for her sake and for our sake that she's right about that. I mean, the other thing is, oh, Michael, just I suppose briefly, is that the, the conversation, and I don't know whether it's the rest of the world, but particularly here in Ireland, has kind of centred around, you know, being gender critical mm. uh, and talking about transgender people. So that, that conversation, in other words, you're not allowed, or you won't be allowed, I fear that you won't be allowed, or certainly there'll be a chilling effect to stop you saying, I don't believe a man can become a woman. I mean, so if that conversation at the moment is around that, do you fear then that the freedom of speech or the, uh, this excitement the hatred act or this hatred act, I should say a uh, hate speech act, should go on then to stop people talking about climate change? That might be the next one. Of course. Um, of course, we had a pandemic before that, but of course we weren't so into it at that point, so some people were getting away about talking about it and talking about it and being anti-establishment. But do you fear that there will be other things down the road then to make this worse? I mean, the question you have to ask these politicians or people on the street is, when in human history have marginalized or vulnerable people ever been protected by censorship? Can you give me one example of that? They cannot because there is no example of that. Every movement for human liberation, one of the first things that they demand is freedom of speech. This is what these movements do. They're out there demanding their rights publicly, demanding the right to say who they are. I mean, it, what a... Um, what a shame to the, the movement of lesbian and gay bisexual people, which demanded the right to be out and proud about who they were, to express themselves, to then have a movement come along and say, we're going to censor you if you use the wrong words, to use the wrong language. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that this sort of woke totalitarianism comes out of the left, but it is not liberal. There is absolutely nothing about it. In fact, its, it's most salient characteristic is deeply illiberal, because nothing has been more important to liberalism than free speech and free expression. And nothing has been more important to movements for human liberation than being able to give people voice. So I think this is really, in many ways, this is the end of, what we, of the progressive left. You know, really, most of the most of their, they've achieved everything they wanted. I mean, uh, we achieved everything we wanted on lesbian and gay bisexual rights, on uh, major action on the environment, 
Uh, major action on civil rights, so we have gotten rid of structural racism in our laws. And so what you have is this overhang, this NGO sector, constantly looking for a new way to justify itself, and it ends up turning against society, turning against the people, and turning against free speech. And you, you think about, on an interpersonal level, the way conflicts are resolved between two people, say a husband and wife, or you know, within a family, that you see, the first thing they always tell you in marriage counseling or any of these types of things is they say, you know, communication is key. You have to talk about the things that are upsetting you, the things that you find problematic, and hash it out. And, you know, just if si being silent and letting that resentment simmer under the surface is how you lead to catastrophic relationship blow-ups down the road. And that's yep. just on an individual one-to-one -one basis. So you think about how at a societal-wide level, Sure, some of these issues are very heated, they're very emotive, they could get ugly, potentially, if you're having a big blowout argument at a societal level, we're all screaming at each other because we're so passionate about what we're talking about. That is more healthy than not discussing it and just allowing it to fester under the surface where we're yeah. just a bitter society of frustrated people who have legitimate grievances but can't talk about any of them. Yep. We'll, uh, we're going to take one or two questions from the audience, but just before we do that, uh, I just want to thank Michael uh, for coming all the way to Ireland. Because, mm -hmm. because you know, it's, it's really important that you understand that without Michael, we probably wouldn't have got the international attention that this has got so far. So Michael has done that for us. Thank you. So you anyway. And also... And I get to interview these guys regularly as well. That's a good thing, too. Can I thank Ben as well? Because as you all know, Ben has been the hero when it comes to journalism here in Ireland over the last year.